should be. Oh, doing. cool. Hi, uh, my name is Randolph Duncan. I work at VIA Aquarium. I do the reptile husbandry and presentations. And this is a program I started two years ago at VIA Aquarium. Uh, right now, I have a little collection of animals I do for presentations uh, Tuesday to Saturday. And right now, I have a carpet python. This is a, a semi arboreal species from the east coast of Australia. This is Zeus right here. He's a male. He's about six feet long, head to tail. Uh, right over here, another Australian species. This is a bearded dragon. This is an agamidae, so they're usually agamidae or desert dwelling species. This comes from more of the central Australia. Uh, she's a female, so they usually average around 18 inches. A male gets around 24 inches. And they get the name because of the, whoop, <laughs> the cool color pattern. Uh, they get under their neck when they're stressed out. When they feel threatened, they actually will puff their chin. And they will expose all those spikes right here and they turn their throat all black. And that's just to intimidate larger predators or other bearded dragons. They're very visual cue with communicating with each other so they'll bob their heads or even wave at each other to give visual signals to communicate with each other. Uh, down right here, I'll that for you. this is a South American species from the Amazon rainforest. This is a redfoot tortoise and of course they get the name because of the red spots on their scales right here. She's still young. She's going to be one of our oldest animals at the aquarium. Uh, she's going to get about a foot long in shell length and about two to three inches wide for a female. A male gets about two, two feet and about ten inches wide. And right now she's just hanging out, sitting in the enclosure. They're very inquisitive. Uh, they like to forage around on the jungle floor. They go in between the Amazon rainforest and then the grasslands. And they're an omnivore, so they eat a lot of plants and animals. So small insects, vegetation, and fruit they find on the ground. So they're really cool. She's about six years old, but she'll live over 65 years, which wow. is awesome. And then down over here, uh, I do other animals, not just reptiles. So we have two species of scorpions and one species of tarantulas at the aquarium. Right here, this is a New World scorpion, and it's really bizarre. It's not venomous. This is a vinegaroon, or they call them whiptail scorpions. The largest species comes from south of Florida and they're usually found near swamps and very moist areas where there's a lot of dead logs and leaves or like small caves. They like a high humidity. Now what they get the name vinegar from is because you see their thin tail right there. They actually spray acetic acid out of it and acetic acid is the pH of vinegar so when they spray it it releases this vinegar fume and it causes irritation and a bad taste of something was trying to eat it like a raccoon or frogs or lizards. So it's just a natural protection. What it's doing right now with those legs, right behind the pedipalps or what they call claws, those are modified legs they use as antennae or feelers, which is very bizarre. There's only two groups of scorpions that you would usually see this on. So usually whip tail and tailless whip scorpions. And we actually have a tailless whip scorpion here in our collection, but she's not out today. This one's a female, so expected to live seven plus years. Males only live around seven years. They have a shorter lifespan. And she's only been here for a couple years, so I'm not too sure what her age is, but she's gotta be old. This is an adult sized molt on a female. And you can see those claws, they don't really pinch. They actually squeeze them uh, as they crush their prey. There's a lot of spikes on the inside of their claws, or the petty palps right here. So what they do, they actually open the claws like that. She's just feeling threatened. And they actually will squeeze and pinch their prey. And then they have small little, almost mandibles or teeth right in the middle. And they have a saliva that breaks down with the enzymes or protein or the exoskeleton of their prey. And they kind of slurp it up like a slushy, which oh, is <laughs> pretty gnarly. All right, so can we start off? Can you just say a little bit about the program? I think you said you started it here. Yeah. Um, oh, is it starting now? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't know. Uh, hi, my name is Randolph Duncan. I work at VIA Aquarium. I've been here for three years. I originally started doing touch tank work, and then a year afterwards, uh, since my background experience is working with uh, reptiles and amphibians, and birds of prey and mammals, doing educational work with them, and also being outside this job of a wildlife facilitator, uh, I decided I wanted to implement a hands-on experience with terrestrial animals at VIA Aquarium. So I designed a protocols and procedures uh, mainly focused on reptiles and uh, 
invertebrates, so like true insects and arachnids. So originally started off with just, oh my goodness, two species of animals, which was a corn snake and a Mississippi map turtle. Now the collection, after two years, is uh, 13 species. So we have a mix of reptiles, birds, sorry, no birds. Sorry, we'll cut that part out. Yeah, it's all right. That's uh, just reptiles and invertebrates. Uh, right now, I'm just hanging out with uh, carpet python, and they're found on the east coast of Australia. And then we have a bearded dragon. They're some of our popular animals I bring out for programs. And what I usually do is a hands-on program. We do about 45 minutes. So the first 20 to 25 minutes is me just talking about each animal for about five minutes. And then the last 20 minutes or so is for a hands-on experience with guests. I, originally, I usually start off with just getting people comfortable with the animals. And then I get them a little more hands-on with the experience. Uh, people are free to ask questions during the presentation and afterwards I get a lot of uh, pet questions just with my background of taking care of different sorts of animals uh, throughout over five years. So I get a mix of questions, it's very interesting each program. I, I don't know the demographics before I start a show so usually it's a mix of either children or adults for public programs. Uh, we also do like uh, private presentations uh, for reservations for like uh, K through 12, high school and college. And once in a while we do like nursing home groups, uh, just get everyone engaged with the aquarium. So it's a really awesome experience to mix in uh, aquatic animals and also terrestrial species. And all the species we have here are actually near the coastlines of where some of our aquatic animals are here at the aquarium. Uh, these guys are found on like the East Coast, and that's right not so far from like the Great uh, Great Barrier Reef, which is awesome. And then also uh, Scorpion we have in the tank over there, right below the camera. Uh, it's from south of Florida, right near the Everglades and mangroves, which is pretty cool. Um, so when you do these presentations, do you find that people are scared of the, the reptiles and the insects? Uh, it kind of depends. Uh, there are definitely people that have phobias of snakes that come to the presentation. Uh, those, usually those people will sit in the back and they're just either with a family or by themselves. I had had people uh, come to the reptile shows uh, just to get over phobias or especially phobias of uh, creepy crawlies or insects and they usually don't want to touch it but they'll just look at it and try to get up close. I had one person literally pay a ticket through my whole presentation, uh, hold the snake for about two minutes, and he's like, all right, I got off my phobia. You hand me a snake and walk right back out. I <laughs> uh, had one woman petrified of the tarantula I brought out to shows, <laughs> and uh, she ran for the door as I brought out the tarantula. She was panicking. I thought she was about to pass out. Uh, even some of my coworkers had some phobias of the reptiles at the beginning and also the terrestrial animals. Uh, just because they were not used to it, they're just used to with everything behind the glass and looking at fish. And then slowly over time, people have kind of got over their fears or uh, stereotypes of the animals I have for shows. So it's really cool that I'm not just helping out people for the presentation that pay for a ticket, but also help out staff to get more comfortable with the animals they're not used to seeing. So it's, it's a nice experience. I like it. And do you feel that these uh, these fears or phobias that they have are? You know, are they um, reasonable? Like, would you feel the same thing, or do you think that that's due to like, like what you were saying—the stereotypes and what people see? Oh, oh, that's like more of like a social and psychological. Yeah. Um, if you look in throughout history, depending on the society where you come from or your level of education, that's information that's provided to you, you do see a lot more stereotypes and superstitions of the animals, uh, like bearded dragons. In Australia, it's like finding a squirrel outside in your backyard, so there's not a lot to worry about it. Yeah. Even this carpet python, people are freaked out about it because of the size. But this is a common snake to see. The one you have to worry about is actually the smallest thing, or you don't really see that's highly venomous. Uh, but it depends on what your culture, your background is, and that develops your stimulus and behavior to what you're going to be seeing out in the wild. And a lot of desensitizing. It's with everything with social media. Uh, not everyone is so engaged with wildlife and doing you know, conservation work in that sense, especially at small schools for kids. Uh, so there, I get weird questions like people sometimes don't believe the animals that are sitting on the table are real. <laughs> they think it's like a robot. They just like, I guess, 
puzzle that something will be right next to them that they're not used to seeing or they just always see it on TV so they're like, oh, they're dangerous and have this, all these ideas running through your mind. It's a lot of mix of things. It could be a cultural experience, uh, a, a stereotype from your society of what you have on those animals or wildlife. So we try to like break those barriers as best as possible and that helps with doing those hands-on programs with a controlled uh, environment. You don't want to do this out in the wild. I don't want to throw a wild snake in someone's face and they end up getting hit and yeah. it just increases that uh, bad stereotype or phobia. But if you can do it in a controlled environment that everyone feels comfortable, even the animals, there's no stress being involved, uh, you can start breaking those barriers on a reasonable sense. You don't want to go too far with like anthropomorphizing. That's the far opposite I have to worry about too. Is when people think everything's like a Disney character. Yeah. And I've seen that abroad where I visited China and people thought like trying to stick your hand in a red panda enclosure uh, was okay. And try to feed it snacks, uh, which is a very bad idea because red pandas are kind of aggressive in the wild. So they're not like a cute cuddly creature. Uh, people think about when they see it on TV or in movies. So I had to deal with those contrasts. Either they're too friendly with the animals or very uncomfortable. So it's like a mix. And sometimes I have that mixture in my presentations and I just have to gauge that as well as possible and get everyone on the same level of that yeah. They're just understanding and getting that teaching experience and then that uh, uh, inspiration part comes in afterwards. So I try to hit on three keys to get those leveling wheels. Uh, so it's advocating, educating, and inspiration. I can't just uh, yell and shout at you like, hey, these are cool animals, they're not gonna hurt you. This is what it has to be. Uh, this doesn't work like that. A lot of uh, conservation groups trying to do the advocating part a little too harsh, and you don't get your message across. Uh, so when you're advocating and explaining why, which is the educational part, why these animals aren't dangerous or threatening to you, and then that last part, which is the most, the I guess, most meaningful, most meaningful part. Sorry, it's hard to talk with this mask. No. Most meaningful part, or the best part of the programs, is getting that inspiration, and that's that hands-on experience. So just cl uh, close up. So it's a great teaching tool when you have those three keys in there. Uh, it just helps out with your program. So the advocating, educating, inspiration. If anyone's watching this and you're trying to get into animal conservation or educational work, you try to want to hit those all those three keys as best as possible. In some days, it's not great, and it just kind of goes all over the place. So it's it's a challenge sometimes. And do you feel that when uh, people sit and they they really listen to you and they have this encounter with the animal, do you feel like they leave? Um, and those stereotypes have been eliminated. And I mean, there's a ton of quotes all over the place where it's um, awareness inspires conservation. And then another one is people want to save what they care about. So do you feel like people are more likely to care um, about conservation efforts and the animals in general after having this experience with you and your animals? Ooh, that's a very good question. I don't get that often. <laughs> I always tell myself where I'm ta teaching people how to do educational work if I get like one person engaged and listen to me then I can die happy like I literally say can just choke my neck and I'm like oh well, that person listened to me that day it's fine uh, that is a very difficult question that I don't know if I actually
start at a local sense of work with your community and then kind of slowly trickle out that way like a wave, then it starts to, I think everyone starts to get it. But you just have to start communicating more and working with your on that sense of the educational part. Hope I answered that correctly. <laughs> awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. No problem. I'm just gonna...